Okay. Uh, um, okay, so before I started, there was two things I wanted to mention. Um, one is that in the reading for next time, so there's um, um, so next time we're starting Spinoza and the readings are uh, both from the ethics and from this other book, the theological political treatise. Uh, and the, oops. The theological political theological political treatise readings are up on campus. I think I already put them. Up. They should be up on campus. If not, I'll put them up tonight. All right, and um, and sorry, there and there. I spread it over three pieces. They don't really go together with the ethics reading. It's just like it's kind of a separate track. Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna put something on school. What theological, theological, political? Oh, okay. All right. Theological okay. political treatise. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, what was I saying? Oh, so it's you know the reading from the theological political treatise is divided into three parts, but it's all one PDF file, so you just have to figure out where to stop each time. Um, all right, and the other thing is I just wanted to mention, oh, I don't have the right numbers for this year, but I just wanted to mention, again, because it sometimes comes up at this point in the course, that like about the grading on the metaphysics exercises, that um, so in 2018 on the same lecture, <laughs> the median total score was 6.8 and the highest was 14. Um, I don't know exactly what it is now. I didn't look it up. But the point is like, uh, um, <clears throat> it's normal to be getting a lot of them wrong. And uh, and uh, if you're near the median score, that means you're getting a A minus or a B plus, even if that's like fifty percent or whatever it is, right? So um, and you're if if you've ever gotten any of them right, you're probably not failing that part. <laughs> So, um, so I know, like when you look on Canvas and it says you're, you know, you're you're at fifty percent, oh, it's a fail or whatever. Just that's I, I don't grade it that way at all. Just don't pay attention to that. <laughs> um, okay, are there questions about either of those things? Yes. Um. So on syllabus it says there's a metaphysics exercise due tonight. Oh, and I didn't put it up. I don't think you put it up. Crap. All right, it won't be due tonight because it's not up. <laughs> Sorry, in one thing or another, I forgot. All right, none of the future ones are posted. Yeah, no, I don't. I usually put them up at the last minute, but in this case, I guess I left it till after the last minute. All right, I'll try to get it up tomorrow so you can do it. Um, I'll push the I'll push the due dates forward somehow. Uh, do you get the feeling I'm not? Who's the most organized person? <laughs> I don't know how, how you would get that feeling. All right. Anyway. <laughs> um, okay. Any other questions? Anything else I forgot to do? All right. Um, okay. So even though I have to cover all of the fourth and sixth meditation, which is too much, I'm going to start by saying something more about the third meditation. Um, I mean, it will lead directly into what we need to talk about today, but 
I hope I don't spend too much time on it. Um, right. So, so first of all, you know, I just want to go over again what I was talking about at the end last time. That so there's really there's three different modes of being that Descartes distinguishes: um, objective, formal, and eminence. And um, so objective and formal being are what I mostly talked about last time. The objective being of something like, here's my mind, and here's the idea. This is the idea of a horse. And I guess this is it. Let's say this is the idea of a particular horse, the idea of Bucephalus. So Bucephalus has a kind of existence in the idea. That's objective B. Remember, I said it's it's misleading because we like we think of objective as like um, objective sounds like something good. So you think like objective being is is like a super strong kind of being or something like that. Formal being maybe sounds kind of like I don't know, empty, like or something like that. But that's that's not what the words mean here, right? The, the word objective being means that Bucephalus exists only as object of the idea, right? So it's a it's a lower mode of being. It's like it is a way for Bucephalus to exist, but it's not like the normal way for him for Bucephalus to exist. It's like a lesser way for him to exist. <laughs> and then there's the formal being, which is the actual being of Bucephalus. I mean, Bucephalus is dead now, but I guess uh you know, I'm representing something that really existed when I think of Bucephalus. And that's that's Bucephalus in his formal being. And, you know, it's called formal because it's like the form of Bucephalus is in matter, making him actual. Um, so, and this is kind of an image of this, right? That's what I was saying, that this is kind of like the relationship between uh, platonic forms um, in its instance, yeah. Does that mean that, like, if I'm thinking about Bucephalus, then he objectively exists, but then if he was, like, right in front of me, then he formally exists? Right, or if he's anywhere, he formally yeah. exists, yeah. Oh, yeah. if he's anywhere, so, but then also if I'm... So thinking about it is not like objective existing is not like imagination. Okay, I'm wait, now I'm confused about what you're asking. So if Bucephalus exists, like what we would normally mean by saying Bucephalus exists, that's formal existence. Okay. Um so there can be form Bucephalus can have formal being without having objective being if no one represents him. But uh, also things can have objective being without having formal being if someone represents them, but they not don't exist. Oh, okay. Right. So uh, like if this were a, a horse that doesn't exist, like Rosinante, it was made up by Cervantes, so it doesn't exist, but Rosinante has objective being. Okay, so things can also have the multiple like beings at the same time. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so eminent being is a little harder to understand. Um, I mean, uh, it means so, like, so, like, here's Aristotle's explanation for how spontaneous generation is possible. Spontaneous generation means 
Like, so here's the regular generation of a mouse. <laughs> the, the father mouse is the Aristotelian view of uh, re how reproduction works. The father mouse transmits the form into the matter. The matter is like the mother mouse's menstrual blood or something. Anyway, the father mouse transmits the form of mouse into the matter that's supplied by the mother and there, thereby there comes to exist a mouse offspring, right? Which, so the mouse offspring got the form of mouse from the father because the father had that form, right? But um, what about this case where there's just like a pile of rags in the sun and a mouse comes to be from that? <clears throat> First, that's not a real case, but people thought it was a real case. <laughs> so there's an explanation for it, right? Like, how could this happen? Well, the answer is it's caused by the sun. Now, but wait, the sun doesn't have the form of mouse. The sun is the sun, not a mouse, right? So at least, like, at least the way Thomas Aquinas explains this, do I think this is clearly what Aristotle means? Probably not. Probably not clear. But anyway, at least the way Thomas Aquinas explains this, the sun has, because the, the sun is a like higher type of being, right? It's this this is sublunar beings down here, or these are celestial bodies up here, right? So because the this the sun has is a has a higher mode of being than a sublunar body, it like it has the form of a mouse in a, in a higher sense. It's like more mouse than a mouse is. <laughs> I mean, that sounds weird. Like it's not at all like a mouse, but put it this way, like it's more alive than a mouse is, right? So, it has like, it's a high, like a higher form of life than a mouse is, right? So, um, so it can, so the sun is able to, um, contribute forms to everything down here. And sorry, I know questions about this, but let me just finish. And in fact, like, in fact, again, at least the way Thomas Aquinas understands Aristotle in this is that um, even in the regular case, where the form came from the father mouse, it's the, the father mouse is responsible for the form coming into the matter at this time, but the father mouse isn't what sustains the form in the offspring, right? Because the father mouse can die and the offspring can still be alive. What's So even in this case, actually, it's the sun or other celestial bodies, but I guess especially the sun, that like directly conserves the forms of sublunar things. Um, so this is why, as he says, when like the plants move away from the sun in the winter, they, they wither up and die. <laughs> All right. Um, so that's a little bit of like incorrect uh, biology, but um, but like as you know, that's the thing about these these weird things that seem like super medieval and like they couldn't have any relationship to us turn out to have repercussions in modern philosophy where like where you wouldn't notice that it had anything to do with this right so so this idea so this the idea of eminent being is again is of some something that's has in which Bucephalus or the perfections that that make Bucephalus what he is have existence in a higher sense. Yeah. That's I'm not normally one to <laughs> like advocate Aristotle, but he's kind of right in a way, right? If you say if instead of form you say energy, then it is true that like there would be no ability to move in a mouse if it didn't radiate downward from the sun. Um, well, 
I know that's not what he means. Yeah, but it's you can read it that way. It's kind of true, but it's almost by accident, right? Like it's a different reason. I mean, you know, like because the sun isn't really a different kind of body from subunit of bodies. No. It's right. So well, I mean it's just it, it just happens to be a body that's able to stay hot for a long time. Uh, <laughs> eventually it will run out, but um and you know, I mean, if you imagine like the mouse living in a thermal vent or something, it wouldn't depend on the sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just to clarify, eminent being is like the higher form of the mouse, or like the yeah. perfect form of the mouse. Right. It's or it's like I mean I get I think the the main the last way I put it maybe makes it sound the most reasonable. It's like the perfections that exist in a mouse that make it a mouse all exist but in a higher form in the sun. Yeah. Um so like the non-higher forms of those perfections exist within the formal and well, would they just exist within the formal? They exist within the formal being, and then they exist in an even weaker sense in the objective form. Yeah. Is this synonymous with platonic forms? It's uh, not synonymous with platonic forms, but it's part of, yeah, the way of reconciling Platonism and Aristotelian form. Oh. Oh. And of course, you know, the sun isn't like the sun isn't by itself enough to sustain the universe. The sun itself is sustained by God, right? By way of the angel that moves the sun. So God is the messiest mouse of all. Yes. So in so in I mean, as Descartes says, God contains all the perfections of which I have any conception and others of which I have no conception. But like, what does that mean? So if like one of the perfections is like, um, like the ability to smell, does that mean that God can smell really well? Well, no, it's uh, like that perfection is found in God in an eminent sense. Right. And in fact, all the perfections, remember at some point in the first meditation, no, no, sorry, in the third meditation, Descartes says that um, one of the most important attributes of perfection is the um, simplicity and indivisibility of all the infinite perfections. Right. So like that tells you, and this is frankly platonic, and it's connected to what I'm going to say in a moment about the solution to the problem of evil, that, you know, um, all of those perfections that we say exist in God, it's all just one perfection in God, right? There aren't like a whole bunch of different ones. It's all the same one. <laughs> and that's part of what, what makes this a higher sense, right? It's more simpler and more unified. That's a platonic thought or neoplatonic thing, right? That God is the one beyond being, something like that, right? Um, so that, and as you go down the hierarchy, you get less unified and more dispersed. Right, so like the sun, you know, has parts outside of parts, it's extended, so it's not that simple, but the form of the sun, you know, is the only form that's ever in this matter. And it's only ever in this matter, right? Because it's always vacuum one sun. <laughs> um, so it still has unity in a much higher way than the sublunar bodies do. Yeah. So Descartes is very insistent on the impossibility of contradiction. Yeah. Wouldn't this mean that God contains both perfect anger and perfect non-anger, and also that they're the same thing in God? Is that well, contradiction? it means that only one of it means that one of them is a perfection and the other is a privation. Okay. Right. So um, so he can 
is perfect mouse, but not perfect lack of mouse. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, Right. So, I mean, this is like, so when you go through the argument of the third meditation carefully, you know, you'll, you'll see that he says that a certain degree of objective being requires at least that degree of formal being or eminent being, right? So in other words, like, <coughs> if I have an idea of a mouse, then there must be something, Descartes' argument is, there must be something as at least as perfect as a mouse existing in actuality. Or there must be uh, like something more perfect than any mouse that contains the mouse perfections in an eminent sense, right? So like so so um, that's why you know the fact that I have ideas of bodies doesn't prove that there are bodies, because it just proves that there's something at least as real as as a body. In, and it could be in an eminent sense. So, so God could be the cause of all of them. Right? In the sixth meditation, he's going to argue that that can't be the case because God is not a deceiver. But as far as we know in the third meditation, right, all my ideas of bodies could come directly from God because the, the idea of a body contains certain perfections, right? Like size and shape and whatever. And um so those would exist informally in an actual body but they exist eminently in god so god is sufficient to explain how i have this idea and perhaps descartes also suggests that even i since i'm a substance might be able to give myself these ideas right because i have the same degree of reality as a body or a plant yeah. So when Descartes takes like eminent, formal, and objective reality from these, it's like an Aristotelian tradition. Is he just like more or less taking it wholesale and appropriating it, like, you know, without really that much augmentation of how, how it's supposed to be interpreted or, or understood, or is he doing something else with that? When that's, he's doing that? that's a good question. I mean, I think what he's doing with it is. Yeah, I think he's using it in a fairly straightforward way, although like some of the other things, you know, around it have changed, like what an idea is or, you know, whatever. But, um, but of course, he's not taking over this cosmology, right? Like, you know, I mean, although he doesn't want to say it because he'd get in trouble, he agrees with Galileo. The sun is just a, you know, it's a body like any other body. Um, so the, you know the the properties of the sun are extension and modes of extension. Um, so uh, like where this eminent being could be has changed, but yeah, I think he's and and the the terminology is not um, like eminent, I believe, is used by Thomas Aquinas in this context, but these are late scholastic terms. I don't know exactly where they come from. Um, Descartes probably got them from Suarez, 17th century. 16th century? Scholastic. Anyway, 16th century, I guess. Um, All right. Um, so, all right. That was just to fill in one thing. Um, but now I want to talk more about, and I did mention this last time, and I want to talk more about what it means. So Descartes says that, so the, an idea itself, an idea is something in which something has objective reality. At least, like to the extent that it's um, uh, a clear and distinct idea, something has objective reality in it. 
but the idea also is a being in its own right, and so it has formal reality. Right? So, I mean, this idea actually exists, plus Rosinante exists in this idea objectively. <laughs> um, Rosinante doesn't actually exist, but the idea does. So the idea has its own formal reality, and um, Descartes says, uh, I read this before, I think. Um, this is on page 90. Insofar as the ideas are simply modes of thought, there is no recognizable inequality among them. And the, on the next page, so this is AT40, and the, that was AT40, and this is AT41, or page 91 in this text. The nature of an idea is such that of itself it requires no formal reality except what it derives from my thought, of which it is a mode. Right? So, like, as far as formal reality goes, all these ideas are on the same foot. They differ from each other in their objective reality. I mean, I think... It's not just the reality, right? They differ from each other in their objects. Like what makes the two ideas different from each other is they have different objects. But insofar as you consider them simply as ideas, they're the same. Um, uh, right? This so this is also like Descartes didn't uh invent this. The scholastics talk about it. It's like based on what something that's definitely explicit in Aristotle that motions are individuated by their endpoints, right? Like two motions are different from each other because they they, they go in different directions. <laughs> um, and they say, you know, the same thing is true of ideas or representations or what, uh, concepts or whatever you want to call them, that they, um, they're individuated by their objects. Maybe that is a whole style of genetic. In any case, um, right. So, um, um, so okay. So far, so good. But what what is the common formal reality? Right. Like what what is it? What is it to be an idea? We forget about what its object is. So I think, and this is uh, a specifically Cartesian thought, as far as I know, um, that um, what they all have in common, that is, um, their, uh, um, their formal or subjective nature that they all have in common is their relationship to the will. Specifically, that they're suitable to be affirmed or denied. And how do I know that they have that common form and formal nature? Well, because the one thing I know for sure about all of them is that they're modes of a doubting thing. <laughs> That's how the cognitive argument worked. Um, that is, of a thing that wills to affirm all that is certain, and furthermore, wills not to affirm what is not certain. <laughs> right? right? That's like that's what doubt consists in. You want to be certain but you don't want to believe anything that's not certain. <laughs> um, so like, so a doubting thing is a thing that can affirm or deny its ideas, or in other words, its ideas are things that can affirm or deny. Um, and that's why um, in the fourth meditation, the meditator is going to is going to say that, and this is where this comes from: that the will is one such simple thing. Said so God couldn't have given me some of it and not all of it. 
um, that's that's going to be super important to the explanation of the possibility of error in the fourth meditation. It's one simple thing. And this is what he says about it. This is on page 101 to 102, HE57. Um, the will simply consists, this is where I want to, yeah, so after he says that, that 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 even though God, you know, uh, God's will is a lot better off than my will in many respects, it's not more of a will. There isn't more. There's, you either have a will or you don't. <laughs> um, this is because the will simply consists in our ability to do or not do something. That is to affirm or deny, to pursue or avoid. Or rather, it consists simply in the fact that when something is put forward for our consideration by the intellect, we are moved to affirm or deny it, or pursue or avoid it, in such the, a way as we feel we are not determined by any external force. Right, so a free will is something that is, all my ideas are the same <laughs> from a formal point of view. I either have a free will with respect to all of them, or I don't have a free will with respect to any of them. And we know it's the former because like the only way I'm sure I have ideas, again, is because of the cognitive argument. And the cognitive argument depends on my ability to affirm and deny. <laughs> um, Um, okay, I was going to say something about power. I mean, maybe I should say it. So the ideas all have this formal being, what's the, you know, uh, what has to still be supplied to them is, is an object. <laughs> um, um, and power, insofar as the meditator understands it at this point, therefore, is the power to supply an object for the idea. <laughs> now, I mean, there's two ways of doing that in principle. So one way of supplying an object for an idea is to make it, right? That's the practical way. Um, the other way of supplying an object for an idea is to um, affirm or deny it. <laughs> that is to um, judge that something exists or doesn't exist using the idea. That's the theoretical way. And so far, as far as the meditator is concerned, um, those are both the same, or you can only do the second one, right? Like, there's no way to make external things. We can't know that there's a way to make external things, so you haven't proved that there are external things. The meditator said, you know, at least I'll do what is in my own power, that is, not assent to anything that isn't certain. And assent to everything that is certain, right? So, um, maybe I shouldn't have gotten into this. Well, So that is the power I have is the power to um, um, I think I should put this off another time I watch it. But okay, so um, the doubt means. I will to know things, but I don't know them. 
the power is the power to produce that gap or to know that gap. It's the same thing as far as the meditator is concerned, right? That is what's in my power is to, is to judge things. What's in my power is to judge that. Um, I will to know some things, but I don't know them. That is that I'm doubting. So the power that I have is the, the power to um, to be aware of doubt, <laughs> to be aware of myself as a doubting thing, and that's it. Um, Yeah, I think that's right, but I'm not sure. I, I keep saying, I keep wondering whether I should have said this here or not. I'm thinking maybe I shouldn't, but yeah. <laughs> um, did Descartes, this slight like, did, did Descartes establish that uh, God being supremely good is certain? Well, um, so, I mean, first of all, he says, Yes, right. I mean, but but I guess if you ask, how is that shown? So God has infinite perfections. Now, so you might say, well, it's because being good is a perfection, which I guess is true in some sense of good, right? Like the one beyond being is also called the form of the good. <laughs> I mean. But um, but the question is how to get from that to uh, specific things, and in particular to the one Descartes needs that God is not a deceiver. Um, so he says all deception is, right? In other words, this kind of good means like completeness, right? Like not lacking anything. And the question is how do I get from that to something like, um, God will be nice to me. <laughs> um, uh, and I, yeah, I mentioned this briefly last time. I think um, and I think I'll get back to it again today, but I, I mean, I think the idea is that um, not lacking something means, so, I mean, let's say when if I lie to you, that means um, I want to know something for my purposes, but for my purposes, I don't want you to know it, right? So, like, that means that I have, like, a private interest. Um, right? Like, my will is... Um, determined by the fact that I'm me and not you. Because if I were you, I would want you to know it and me not to know it. <laughs> so, right? So in other words, I want this body here to not feel pain and feel pleasure. And I don't care about that body there. And so um, I want knowledge for the mind that's associated with this body and not for the mind that's associated with that body. And so I think that's why um, Descartes says that deception is a manifestation of weakness, right? It's because I only have this body and not also that body, right? It's like because I'm finite that I that that it makes sense for me to deceive you. I'm it's my finite private interests. If I was if I had everything, I didn't need anything then I wouldn't have any private interest. Um, and then if I wanted knowledge for myself, and of course, God does want knowledge. How do I know God? I mean, that is, God wills to have knowledge, right? I mean, it's the will is already in effect, it's not something he wants for later, right? But God, how do I know God wills to have knowledge? Because 
the whole way I argued for the existence of God was by saying that God has all the per perfections that I lack, right? So, like, it's the part of me that's a that's a perfect image of God is the the will for all those perfections, and the part that's uh, finite is that I don't have all of them. <laughs> right. So, like, so. So if I don't have any private interests and I will knowledge, then I will it for everyone. Right? It can't be like to my benefit for someone else not to know it because nothing is to my benefit. I guess I didn't explain that very coherently, but as I tried to trying to say before, it's like a version of how of Kant's derivation of why lying is a violation of the moral law because like um when i when i will to deceive you i can't at the same time will that my that that this should be universal right like i only want it for myself but i don't want it to be a universal law that everyone's deceived doesn't that kind of imply that god is deceiving you because they're not sharing all of the information um that god knows with you well okay i think we should put this off to yeah to like that, but but it's you know but um that's a that's a subcase of the general problem of the metaphysical problem of evil how can a perfect being have an imperfect effect right so i mean um um, the answer is, or the beginning of the answer is, well, a perfect being can't have a perfect effect because a perfect being doesn't have a cause. It's self-sufficient. <laughs> so if it's going to have any effect at all, it's going to have to be an imperfect effect. Um, so, uh, so I can't ask, why didn't God create me absolutely perfect? Right. If I were absolutely perfect, I wouldn't be created. I would be God. <laughs> the option was to create me imperfect or not create me at all. God can't create us to be perfect. Is it not all powerful? Then? Well, it's, I mean, he's not all powerful in the sense that he can't cause a contradiction to be true like a perfect being to have a cause. <laughs> um, so, uh, but that, that's, that's, I mean, again, as I said, like the way Descartes and a lot of other people think about that is that that power, that power to create a, have a, con make a contradiction be true is not, a, um, nothing's objectively real in it. Because it's formally uh, um, it's formally incorrect. So um, that is the idea of something that contradicts itself is is an idea that fails to to have any objective reality. So um, and so like the will or the power to actualize that idea is like not a real, it's not a power to do anything. <laughs> so that's why that, like that limitation on omnipotence, that it's, it's limited by what's logically possible or not self-contradictory isn't really a limitation. I, um, All right. I'm afraid I kind of got off into weird realms with this, but <laughs> um, let me <clears throat> let me go back a little bit closer to to the text, right? So, what does it mean to affirm or deny an idea? Um, so, normally there are two different parts to it. I think. Um, so. Uh, 
one of them. One is to affirm or deny that it is an idea, so to speak, um, that it's an image of a possible object. Um, I guess I could say this like, so like, I mean, this type of, in, this type of affirmation or denial is at work in a lot of places in the meditation. So it's really important to Descartes, right? Like when he asks whether um, the, you know, the concepts of geometry or the, the ideas of geometrical figures, um, you know, are true or false or real or chimerae or whatever, right? Of course, he's not, he's just asking, are they really ideas? That is, does something really have objective reality in it? Um, so if you, if the answer is no, you're so to speak rejecting that idea. You're saying that it's like it's obscure or confused, and it doesn't really succeed in representing anything. Um, so, or to turn it around, I guess you say when you affirm it as an idea, that means you affirm that its object is possible. Um, possible, well, possible at least by omnipotence, <laughs> right? It doesn't contain a contradiction. Um, but second of all, this is normally different to affirm It is caused by its object. Um, and right, this means it has an actual object. Right? So like if I have the idea of Bucephalus and I add to that that the idea that idea is caused by Bucephalus. Maybe not directly, but somehow that idea was caused by Bucephalus. Um, then um, that is, it's caused by something that has informal reality, exactly what my idea has an objective reality. And that means that the um, idea uh, is the idea of an actual object. I mean, I guess you could say, um, right? It's enough that the same thing has formal reality as has objective reality in my idea. The causation is a way of explaining how that can happen. How could it be? What a coincidence that the same thing has objective reality in my idea. It has formal reality outside my idea. The answer is, causation, and it's the kind of paradigmatic causation, as they say, the kind of causation that a platonic form has in, on its image, right? The, the um, Bucephalus like, causes himself to be imaged in my mind. Right, I mean, you, you understand how this works, like if I'm looking at Bucephalus, well, I mean, <clears throat> you don't really understand how it works, and it's gonna have to turn out to be a hard, point for Descartes to explain how this is possible. But somehow, the fact that I'm looking at Bucephalus, you know, first particles come off Bucephalus and go into my eye, and they do something in there, and then the animal spirits travel and they do the nerves to my brain, and they flow around and something. And then there's like a part of my brain called the pineal gland that's right in the middle. And all the animal spirit, this is Descartes' theory, and all the animal spirits kind of converge on that. And a, like a kind of Bucephalus type impression is made on this pineal gland. And then it's like question mark, question mark, question mark, <laughs> profit. Like somehow that wriggling of the pineal gland results in me having an idea of Bucephalus. <laughs> yeah. What about ideas that the meditator doesn't have? 
yeah. like or things uh objects that the meditator doesn't sense yeah like because i mean at, like we are limited we are individually limited like there are things that i literally cannot experience because of the body that i'm in that other people experience every day uh and there are also things that i probably will never see like um i don't know a, a moon crater or like or the center of the sun yeah <laughs> exactly yeah i'm never going to see the center of the sun i'll also probably never see like um the microorganisms that live on my hands and shit and and uh other things like what does it mean for things that ideas that the meditator doesn't have or objects that the meditator doesn't sense well I mean, what do you mean? What does it mean? So the meditator obviously can't can neither affirm nor deny those. I mean, well, like it calls some, them into doubt. I would say. I mean, in some cases. So you're talking about like, I mean, at first, although we can't see the center of the sun or the microbes that are in our hands, we have good reasons for believing they're there. Like, I, I guess they do cause our ideas of. Right, just not directly, so, right? So, you know, like the real case with Bucephalus, I've never seen Bucephalus and I never will, obviously. I read about Bucephalus, you know, in some book or on some web page or both, right? And, uh, you know, but as we say, there's a causal chain. <laughs> it starts with Bucephalus and ends with my idea of Bucephalus. And the same thing is true of the center of the sun, right? And we see the outside of the sun. And, there has to be something inside it. So, I mean, um, but uh, actually, we know quite a bit about what's inside it, even though we can't see it. Um, and, you know, the microbes on your hand, you, you know, if you got a microscope, you could see them. Um, and even if you never see those with a microscope, you know, because other people look at microscopes, there's microbes. I, I guess I was I was more thinking about like where like societal concepts exist in this paradigm, like things that aren't um, concrete, but maybe they don't fit in at all, and that's a separate thing. Justice, or like social constructs. Yeah, or like racism, <clears throat> or fill in the blank. There are lots of things. Right. Okay. Um, so that's a somewhat different question. That, that that's really a, I mean, that's a whole different area of question than you were asking before. I think. Yeah, so, it is. Right. Yeah. So. Um, Well, so like exactly what Descartes will have to say has gone wrong is maybe going to depend on exactly why racism is wrong. Um, but let's say, uh, um, there really is no such thing as as a race. Mm -hmm. Of course, here I mean this race, not this race. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So uh, uh, there really is no such race as a race. So you know. So then that would mean that if like I if I have an idea of a certain race. Mm -hmm that idea must be somehow uh, confused and obscure. Mm. Just like my idea of color, <laughs> not perhaps by coincidence, right? According to Descartes, you know, if I, if I might think, well, this race is different from this race because they're different colors, but actually color also is a bad idea according to Descartes. Right. Like it's confused and it's in particular I'm confusing something subjective about me with something objective about the object. Mm -hmm. So um, 
So in the in the case of race, you know that that might be um, it's going to be more complicated in the case of color, but maybe it involves certain passions and whatever. And I'm like, um, I'm you know like if I don't like certain people, I'm confusedly thinking that that there's something about them <laughs> that's not likable rather than something about me. So, right, so in other words, I think Descartes does have ways to deal with issues like that. I mean, you can come up with worse examples that, um, that have to do with like the ways his physics is wrong and, and how would he explain that, you know? <laughs> but I don't, you know, I mean, I guess he can't really be expected to explain that. He thinks he proves his physics is, is right, but yeah. For the like A and B stuff, the Fermi, yeah, an idea and the Fermi as caused by an object, or those specifically for things that like we like we're like figuring things out, I suppose. I, I don't really like. Well, like, so in the case we were just talking about, if it turns out that race is just a bad idea, right, but then then we would say, we would deny the idea, right? Yeah, and we would reject the idea, say it's confused. Which race are we talking about? No, this the race. Concept. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember I once, I don't know if I'm a grad student or prospective grad student in my office or something, and I, they were like, what are you working on? And I'm like, well, I'm, one thing I'm working on is the history of the word race. And they got all excited because they, they thought I meant this, but I actually meant that. <laughs> they figured out, they were like, oh, well, who cares about that? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but you see, they are related to each other, right? You know, because they, they, Descartes' approach to this I'm imagining would be to, to deny that this is real. <laughs> um, that right, deny that this has objective reality. If if Descartes wanted to criticize racism in a certain way, I have no idea what Descartes' actual. I mean, like some of the later philosophers, like Kant and Hume, you know, they said they were racist, but I don't. I never heard anything like that about Descartes. I wasn't as much on his radar screen at that earlier time, but I don't know. Anyway, but supposing Descartes wanted to criticize racism, which is which is very possible that he would, right? I mean, remember how much he emphasizes that as far as the essential nature of human beings, we're all the same. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, so he would do it in terms of this. <laughs> um, and And that would mean like, again, it would mean not saying, because that's why I said it depends on exactly why you think racism is wrong, right? Like if you think, well, it could be true, it just doesn't happen to be true or something like that, then you might say the problem is here. But if you think there's something wrong with the idea, then you would say the problem is here. Um, Um, right, and you know, so if an idea is clear and distinct, I, I uh, should affirm it in this sense. I must affirm it in that sense. That's, I mean, that um, that wasn't clear until the third meditation, but now it's supposed to be clear. And that, remember, we saw him using that in the fifth meditation to say that mathematics and whatever is okay. Um, on the other hand, if an idea is confused and obscure, those are the opposites of, of well, confused is the opposite of distinct and obscure is the opposite of clear, um, then I shouldn't affirm it in this sense. And therefore, for sure, I shouldn't affirm it in this sense. But I can't. Because I can affirm or deny anything. And that's going to be the, the source of error. Yeah. Um, 
So when Descartes makes like a general claim that X exists, is it implied that he's saying that like X formally exists? I think it depends on context, actually. I think this is one of the tricky things, right? Like and it even he even shifts in the middle of the first meditation. That sometimes he's talking about this and sometimes he's talking about this, right? That like because when I, like when he's when he asks whether um um Right, so you know, the trans. This is the transition. First, he's through the dreaming argument. He's determined that he shouldn't affirm any of his ideas that came through the senses. In this sense, he shouldn't judge that their objects exist. Of course, he shouldn't judge that their objects don't exist either. Right, he should suspend judgment. Although he has this fiction going on that it's all false, just, but that's just to remind himself. But what he should actually do is suspend judgment. Um, but then he says, well, but look, um, nonetheless, it must surely be admitted that the visions which come in sleep are like paintings, which must have been fashioned in the likeness of things that are real. And hence, that at least these general kinds of things, eyes, head, hands, and the body as a whole, are things which are not imaginary, but are real and exist. So at this point, it's kind of ambiguous. What does it mean that these general things exist? Right? I mean, it doesn't mean that there's a general head somewhere. <laughs> um, does it mean that there are some actual heads? Or does it mean that at least the idea of a head is a good idea? And I think at this point, it's not clear. But when he goes on to say what the right, so he says, um, by similar, sorry, uh, right, talking about painters, he says, or if perhaps they managed to think of something so new that nothing remotely similar has ever been seen before, at least the colors used in the composition must be real. By similar reason, although these general kinds of things, eyes, head, hands, and so on, could be imaginary, it must at least be admitted that certain other, even simpler and more universal things are real. And those things turn out to be extension and its modes, right? Extension, figure, size, number, place, time, um, and so on. I guess the only other one is, is motion, actually. But, um, Right, so at this point, I think it's pretty clear we've gone over to this. Um, we're, um, it's, I, I don't think we've been given a reason to think that there are actual extended things, but rather that extension is a good idea. That's certainly on the way back in the fifth meditation, all we get at this point. That's, I think that's clear, right? He actually says that near the beginning of the sixth meditation. He says, you know, so now I know that all my ideas of geometry are, you know, I forget exactly the term he used, but you know, that they're all objectively real basically. But, uh, but so I know that God could create their objects, but I don't still don't know that they, are, they have objects. That requires a further argument in this meditation. So that's why I'm saying that, like, sometimes when we say something is real or exists, we mean the idea is good, and sometimes we mean it has an actual object. Yeah. yeah he says that they're the, uh, the subject matter of pure mathematics, all the things that are extensive. And, and so far as uh, he perceives it clearly, like that. Yeah. And so far as they are the subject matter of pure mathematics, uh, he knows that they're capable. They're capable of existing, right? That's this thing, possible object, right? So when you affirm an idea in this sense, you're affirming that its object is possible. Yeah. So how does this apply 
So like the idea of a triangle or a killer dog, where like he does believe that that's a real thing. And he does affirm the idea, but then he doesn't have a direct actual object. Or does he think that he does? No, but he doesn't. I mean, um, yeah, so he doesn't affirm those ideas in this sense at all, right? That is, he doesn't affirm that there's a perfect triangle. That is, he doesn't believe that there's a perfect triangle. So. Um, it's a thin and eminent sense of God, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, look, it's, it's Spinoza who who basically rejects the idea of eminent being, you know, is going to say there must be a perfect triangle in God, and it's a triangle. <laughs> so, right, in every shape, every possible shape must exist. <laughs> um anyway, but 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 Descartes, yeah, Descartes will say, yeah, of course, they if if they're objectively real in me, then they're eminently real in God, but it doesn't have to be a normally real perfect triangle. Um all right. I there's probably more questions, but I, I really haven't started talking about the fourth or the sixth meditation yet. <laughs> I'm running out of time. So, um, um, so let me. Um, uh, I may have, I may regret this, but I'm going to erase most of this. All right. So, um, so that I mean. I mentioned before that whenever you have a cosmological proof of the existence of God, and again, this is Kant's terminology, but a cosmological proof is basically um, a proof that says the world that is something imperfect. exists um, since it's imperfect it's so it's imperfect in a way that rules out it's having caused itself to exist there's different ways of, of filling in I mean I, I think I'm going a little bit beyond what Kant says about about the possible kinds of proof here but I think there's different ways of filling in what the imperfection is. <laughs> But there's something about it that makes it that it couldn't, it's it's imperfect in a way that means that it couldn't have caused itself to exist, right? Therefore, um, it has a perfect cause. Right? Something that is not imperfect in that way, okay? therefore different from it, must have caused it to exist. That's the way the cosmological proof works. And it, so it always leads straight, straight to what's called the problem of evil, or the metaphysical problem of evil. The, the, key, the reason I keep adding metaphysical is that this is the problem, right? So the problem is, how can a perfect cause have an imperfect effect? <laughs> And, you know, so it's like um, the smallest imperfection is enough to start this going. In the meditator's case, it's the fact that, like, I'm not right about everything. <laughs> that's, what, that's what sets the problem of evil going. Right, because it's you know that was that was the imperfection in me that led me that that I used for this proof, 
right? I'm a doubting thing, that is. I want to know certain things that I don't know. Um, uh, so then I turn that around and say, well, but um, so that shows that I must have a cause that doesn't have that imperfection. But then I turn it around and say, but wait, how could that cause have caused this fallible result? Um, so, I mean, it's a metaphysical problem and it's, I mean, like in some sense, what people often mean by the problem of evil, like why are things so bad, <laughs> right? In some sense, like from a certain, like really philosophical abstract point of view, that's just a sub case of this, right? So it's like, you know, okay, I'm not right about everything. Um, that's an imperfection. Like, you know, little children get sick and die. That's an imperfection, you know, right? They're all imperfections. <laughs> um, so, but from some other point of view, like some of those things are real sources of, you know, like religious struggle and whatever. And whereas these, like this question of how imperfection is possible is kind of like, um, not so urgent, right? Like that's, you know, like that should be our worst problem, that the world isn't absolutely perfect, <laughs> right? So, but um, so, but it's this problem of evil that we're talking about here. And this problem of evil always like automatically comes out of the cosmological theory. Um, um, oops. Um, right, I guess, I mean, you, so you can put it a little bit better. So like my imperfect doubting nature proves my dependence on an infinite, but um, satisfied will to self-satisfying will to truth. How can a will like that have an effect that's wrong about anything? <laughs> So Descartes' responses are mostly are pretty traditional responses to the problem of evil, right? Like, I mean, you don't usually hear them in exactly this context because usually the they're based on uh, a, a bigger picture of the world than just the meditator at the end of the third meditation. <laughs> Right, so 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 we we hear about other types of imperfection, um, but like but leaving that aside, the way Descartes responds is, you know, so like <clears throat> the first response is um, that evil, and I guess I should say right, so evil here means imperfection. It doesn't mean moral evil. This kind of older sense of the world for evil, right? Where it just means bad. It doesn't necessarily mean wicked. So, um, so evil means imperfection, right? So, um, so like the the fact that I'm not right about everything is, is an evil. Um, so the first response is that evil is um, just a lack of good, right? Evil is nothingness. Um, right, so this is the towards the bottom of page 99, it's AT54. I realize that I am, as it were, something intermediate between God and nothingness, or between supreme being and non-being. My nature is such that insofar as I was created by the supreme being, there is nothing in me to enable me to go wrong or lead me astray. But insofar as I participate in nothing, nothingness or non-being, 
That is, insofar as I am not myself the supreme being and am lacking in countless respects, it is no wonder that I make mistakes, right? So this is basically the same thing I was saying before that a perfect, the first answer is a perfect cause can only have an imperfect effect because being an effect is an imperfection. <laughs> hey, so like, um, so if I'm an effect of a perfect cause, that means I'm not myself perfect. But everything in me that actually was caused by the cause is a perfection. And everything else is nothing. And it has no cause. Right? So like think of think of being like bigger as a perfection as a perfection <laughs> for a body, right? Like, you know, everybody like got something from God in, and continues to get something from God and conserving it every instant, right? A certain amount of that perfection, a certain amount of size. And then in addition to that, nothing, <laughs> right? Like not any more than that. <laughs> so what it got from God was a limited amount of perfection that is what makes it different from God is that there's some perfection it doesn't have and in that sense it's a mixture of between God and nothing or a medium between God and nothing it has some perfections and all of those came from a perfect cause but it doesn't have all perfections rather in addition to those perfections it has it has nothing else <laughs> and that doesn't have any cause do you have a question I'm just wondering if we're imperfect how can we know the nature of perfection if we unless we're already perfect ourselves it's been perfect also by other definitions include everything in its complete totality meaning god somehow we both contradictory containing both logicality, illogicality, right and wrong, et cetera, et cetera. That's how do we know what the nature of perfection is? If it's a good kind of perfection or if it's a total encompassing perfection? Well, I think the simple answer to how we know it is because our will is infinite. Because our will is an image of the divine will. So our will is a will to all perfection. I mean, that is the simple answer according to Descartes. I'm not talking about how we really know. I don't know if we really know. But, <laughs> but according to Descartes, how do we know what perfection is? We know what perfection is because we want infinite perfection. Um, right, so that's, I mean, that's why I keep, I'm, I feel like I'm not saying this very clearly. Um, and it's partly because I was just working this out right before the lecture, plus trying to glom together, because in most years I've had one lecture on the fourth meditation and another on the sixth meditation, so I was trying to put them together. But um, that the um, that's how we know that that God's will is a will of to infinite perfection, because that's what we know about. <laughs> like, Did he distinguish between our will and God's will and then we moved up to or the Pivots? One of them distinguished that there's a difference between our will and God's will. Yeah, that, that's, I think you saw that and in the objections and replies. I think that possibility of the will similar to God, I think he made some kind of distinction. I forgot exactly. Yeah, there is a the difference of will means something different to God than it does to man. Yeah, I mean, every perfection. So when we, when I, you know, like every perfection is in God in a different sense than it is in us, because like, because, you know, like we have a perfect will and an imperfect intellect that knows some things and doesn't know others. Um, God has a perfect will and a perfect intellect, but further, furthermore, in God, those are the same perfections. <laughs> and are inseparable from each other. So obviously they're not exactly the same as the ones we're talking about. So when you talk about perfections from God being in us, we're being equivocal. Like it's very funny to say God is the perfect mouse, but yes, it's, it's a, a equivocal. Right. And, 
right? I mean, it's just like the very example that Aristotle gave when he introduced the term in the um, categories about how, like, when you call a human an animal and you call a picture of a human an animal, it's equivocal, yeah. right? So it's equivocal, but it's not arbitrary. There is something in common. There's something, well, what's in common is that, that, that our perfection exists in God in an animate sense. And again, if you think that doesn't make sense, I think Spinoza is going to agree with you. So <laughs> that's fine. But um, all right. Um, I still haven't got through the. I guess I should go through the first three responses quickly because although they're all interesting, number one, they are very traditional. Descartes didn't invent them. And number two, Descartes goes through them quickly because they don't achieve what he needs out of the forced meditation. So like take the, the, the response I just gave. I think in the end, Descartes is gonna, despite some problems that he raises right away, I think in the end, Descartes is gonna say that that explanation is right. Um, but that explanation in itself doesn't tell me how I can know when I might be wrong and when I might, when I should be certain, right? Like it just tells me that um, I can sometimes go wrong because I don't have all perfection. But how do I know if this is one of those cases or not? And to go on past, to go on to the fifth and sixth meditation, Descartes is going to need to use the principle that God is not a deceiver as a reason for being certain about certain beliefs, right? So, like, if the explanation of error just says some of my beliefs could be wrong, even though God is not a deceiver, right? Like, that's what the solution to the problem of evil has to be to say, yeah, even though God is a perfect cause, not a deceiver, some of my beliefs can be wrong. But, um, but if I don't know which ones they are, then the fact that God is not a deceiver isn't going to help me like put physics on a new basis and all the other stuff that Descartes wants to do, right? So, um, and the same is true of the second and the third ones. So I guess I didn't write down, you know, the first one is like evil is, is pure negation. So it doesn't have a cause. The second is um, that uh, God's purposes are, are unknown. It's also a traditional answer to the problem of evil. The, the way, the specific way the meditator uses it is to say, um, that uh, since I shouldn't expect to understand why God has done all the things God has done, the fact that some of them seem surprising and hard to account for can't cast doubt on the third meditation truth. Right? So in other words, it's just saying like, okay, we know this proof is right. Then if you ask, but what about these problems with the effect? The answer is, I don't understand what kind of effect a perfect cause could have. It's beyond my comprehension. So whatever this effect is like, I guess that's the kind of effect a perfect cause could have, <laughs> right? Like that's my best evidence. You know, um, there's nothing wrong with this. So that's what we should say. You know, Descartes also slips in a little thing, which. <laughs> I can't resist stopping to talk about this because it's so important. It's probably more important than the details of how these proofs work that um, um, the meditator says, and this is why final causes are useless in physics. So, right. So like a final cause, an efficient, there's, Aristotle has four different kinds of causes. An efficient cause is what we usually call a cause, basically. It's something that kind of pushes and makes something happen. A final cause is like 
the reason why something happened in the sense of like the goal of it, right? So like the efficient cause of the table is, you know, the machine that put it together or whatever. But the final cause of the table is so I can put stuff on it, <laughs> right? Like that's what the table is for. So you might think that, um, I mean, Aristotelians think even without bringing perfect God into or whatever, that you can use final causes to explain what happens in nature, right? Like, why does a mouse do this? Because that is what conserves the species of mouse or something like that, right? That's a final cause. So um, Descartes is using this kind of super pious sounding thing. We God's purposes are incomprehensible to us to completely free physics from any talk about the purposes of things. Right? He's saying, therefore, since we don't understand God's purposes, we shouldn't think we know why a mouse does what it does. Only God knows that. So we should concentrate on the efficient cause, right? Like, you know, what are the small bodies and how do they move around to make the mouse do it? <laughs> um, and the reason I say it's so important is because it's like an example of how you'd like, you really have to pay attention when a philosopher says some religious thing to like, what are they do? What are they using it for? It might be the opposite of what you think. <laughs> um, all right. But as I said, I want to, um, so the the third one is the is like the part whole distinction, right? This also is a very traditional response to the problem of evil, where you say like, well, um, um, you know, the world as a whole may be more perfect because it contains this imperfect part. So the part considered by itself is imperfect. But when you look at it as part of the whole, it's exactly the way it should be to make the whole perfect, or at least relatively perfect, right? Of course, the world is not perfect, but it makes the world better rather than worse. Of course, like at this point, this is like the meditator is just, for all I know, I'm part of some bigger whole because she hasn't proved that there is anything else. <laughs> But that's still good enough, right? Like, so, you know, why is it that um, God has not only not given me certain knowledge, but actually allowed me to go wrong about some things? Well, maybe I'm part of a bigger whole, and the world as a whole is better because I'm wrong about something. Um, Okay, so I mean, that answer may work, but again, it's not useful because I don't know which, it still doesn't tell me which of my beliefs I should be certain about, right? Maybe the whole world is better because I think two plus three is five when it's really six. <laughs> um, so the last answer, and in a way, the last answer stretches over the last three meditations. Um, that is, in a way, there's a common strategy that's per, that's used three different times. Um, but um, uh, in the fourth meditation, it's used in the most general way. Say, like, what kinds of error are, are possible in general? In the fifth meditation, it's used to say, how can I be wrong in things that I seem to have a clear and distinct idea about? Um, that's the least developed answer, but I see it in there. Um, and then the sixth meditation, it's used with respect to the senses. Um, how can I be wrong about the sense, about how can the senses deceive me? And in each case, the answer is supposed to be such that you learn that these are the ways they could deceive me, and therefore these are the ways they couldn't deceive me, and I can be certain. 
And the common strategy is that, I mean, I've already talked about the way this happens in the fourth meditation. I think the common strategy is that I have two different perfections. <clears throat> and one of them is indivisible. And the other one is divisible. So since I'm a finite being, I only have part of the divisible one, right? It has all these pieces and I only have some of them and not the others. But since this one's indivisible, I have to have all of them. <laughs> you either have it or you don't. Um, and the mismatch between this one that I have all of, and this one that I only have part of, means that like the best arrangement for having both of them together um, is um, in some way gonna be um, one that doesn't work all the time. In other words, like the arrangement for how I have these two together is going to be such that it's good in connection with the parts of the divisible perfection that I have. But in the case of parts of the divisible perfection that I don't have, it's going to be uh, at least a possible cause of error. And um, um, the only way to get rid of that, however, would be not to give me the indivisible perfection at all, which would be worse. So I just said that really abstractly. I mean, but um, I mean, I wanted to say it that abstractly because to point out that this also is part of kind of a traditional approach to the problem of evil, right? It's like this Neoplatonic, again, idea that, that um, this is the higher perfection. And this is the lower one. And this one is never really adequate to this one. So it's not able to like completely receive what it what this one has to give. And it can't because it's less unified, it's more dispersed. So I think you know, like Descartes is using versions of that in the um um, but maybe it'll become clear if I talk about the specific cases. So in the fourth meditation, as I already said, the indivisible perfection is the will. And the divisible perfection is the intellect. So divisible is going to mean different things in different cases. But um, the indivisible perfection is the will, and the divisible perfection is the intellect. So in what sense is the intellect divisible, well, um, um, I don't have all ideas, or I don't have clear and distinct ideas of everything. So I have clear and distinct ideas of some things and not of others. But the will is indivisible. So this is just another version of something I already said, but, but presented in a like, more confusing and abstract way. <laughs> that, um, that uh, so, um, so I need to be able to affirm the ones that I have a clear and distinct idea. That's the whole point of having, right? So that, um, so like the will has to apply to my ideas and allow me to affirm or deny them. So as far as the ones that I have a clear and distinct idea of, that um, uh, is a perfection, right? That allows me to do what I'm supposed to. But in the case of the ones that I don't have a clear and distinct idea of, I shouldn't either affirm or deny them. But uh, 
since I'm able to affirm and deny these, I'm also able to affirm, affirm and deny these because I can't have only part of the will. I have to have all of it or none of it. Um, and, um, and so that's why um, I can make incorrect judgments. That is, I can either, there's two ways to make an incorrect judgment. I can affirm or deny something um, in such a way that my judgment is false, right? So like I judge that there is such a horse as Rosinante or that there never was such a horse as Bucephalus, then it's false. Um, um, I'm able to do that to the extent that my ideas of Rosinante and Bucephalus are not fully clear and distinct. But um, uh, the other way is for the judgment to be true, but it's still no good because it's not justified, right? I shouldn't have judged that way because I didn't have the clear and distinct perception. So Descartes says both of those are ways of going wrong, actually. That is, what I should do is affirm these and suspend judgment with respect to those. Yeah. If the will is an instrument of the individual and the will is of the ability to judge truth and falsity, what is guiding the will? Like the will seems kind of like like the tool. Yeah, maybe there's some mistake in the way I'm talking about this. They're making it sound like there's someone else behind the will using it. Like if we can affirm or deny the things that we have clear and distinct ideas, like it seems like there's, I don't know, things going on with that. Okay. So I'm actually out of time. If I had, <laughs> I would have talked about indifference versus uh, uh, rational freedom and like what they kind of saying about them. But yeah, it's, you know, I can affirm or deny these. That's an imperfection in me. That's like a lack of freedom in me because precisely because I don't have any reason for doing one or the other, like any good reason. Just let me say one more thing, even though I'm out of time, which is that in this meditation, the indivisible perfection is going to be the mind, and the divisible perfection is the body. Right? And it turns out that the reason that there's no way for a mind to be attached to a body such that the senses can't perceive it is that the body is divisible and the mind is not. But that's all I need to say. All right. And next time I'll be talking about Spinoza. <laughs>